Here we go. Laith Ashley is a model and actor and actor whose career skyrocketed after gaining attention on Instagram. Shortly after, he was working with top designers and photographers. He became the first transgender man to be featured in a diesel campaign and has walked in New York Fashion Week. Today, Laith joins us to talk about his journey to success and the lessons he's learned along the way. So welcome, Laith. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I don't, what, what do you want me to start? <laughs> I will, I will guide you through this. Okay. Don't worry. Um, our summer camps are for LGBTQ plus youth ages 14 to 18. Can you describe what your life was like at, at that age? I mean, I went to high school in New York. I'm from, I was born and raised in Harlem. Um, so I went to a school called Frederick Douglass Academy. It went from uh, sixth grade to 12th grade. And it wasn't, I wouldn't describe it as anything out of the ordinary. Um, it was a, it's a, a specialized school in, in math and science. So um, I was really good at, at those subjects. Um, and I also, I was also an athlete. So I called myself oftentimes a, a nerd jock because <laughs> I, I played all the sports um, and I also excelled academically. Um, and that was also due to, there was, there was some pressure um, from my, my parents to, to perform well. And there was pressure on, I put pressure on myself as well because I knew I was queer. And I felt that in order to be accepted, I had to be just good at everything. And a lot of that still lingers now where I need, I feel like I need to be perfect, um, even though we know that no one's perfect and um, it can take a toll on, on, on one's mental health. So I try to like take some time for a time to myself and really um, be okay just with where I am um as far as success goes you mentioned success you know success can mean anything to a, a, an individual like for me success is not just um find like movement upward financially or um uh being seen more whether it's on on tv film or in modeling it's also making sure that i'm happy um i know that we all, we, I'm sure that we've all struggled with, with uh, mental health issues. Um, I think it's, it's very human. And I, I, do, and I do like that as time has gone on, folks are, are speaking up about it. Because when I was, when I was 14, um, it was kind of viewed, you, you couldn't, you could talk about it. But if you, if you had, um, if you came forward and said, hey, I, I'm struggling with anxiety I'm struggling with depression you were kind of looked at like you were a bit crazy it was like some especially for me coming from um a uh, uh, Latin background it was just you don't talk about that or if you're if you're having issues with with how it is that you're feeling you you should turn to God uh, go pray about it and do it in private like don't let other people see it and um now it's it's uh I think it's it's healthier the way that we that we approach those types of things I kind of went off on a tangent there, but I hope no, that means no, I, totally, I totally agree. And you naturally went into my next question, which is, oh, okay. did you have a strong support system? Um, my parents were always there to support me um, when I needed basic living things. So, you know, food, shelter, clothing, um, making sure that I had support again, academically. My dad um, was big on sports, so he supported me when it came to um, uh, playing sports. I see in the comments, yes, Troy Bolton energy. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, but uh, when it came to any emotional or uh, I, I would call, I'm just going to say I, there's, there was some emotional instability for sure um, because of that pressure that I put on myself. So sometimes, and because I was also unhappy with my, um, where I was with my gender identity, I, I was still trying to discover that and figure out the language for it, which we didn't really have, or I didn't have at the time. Um, I knew uh, what like gay, lesbian, bisexual was. Trans wasn't necessarily uh, a topic of conversation. I only um, learned about transness when I was at, when I was seventeen, when I right around the time where I was coming out, and I was going to like the village in Chelsea in New York, which is kind of like queer safe haven. And I saw trans women. Um, I didn't know that trans men even existed. I didn't know that there, were, there was no, and there was no language for it. So I just felt, I just thought that I was uh, 
uh, a masculine of center lesbian woman. And I kind of try to navigate that space. And as I um, got closer to uh, some of my other queer friends, and I would ask them questions about how they felt about their their bodies. So specifically, one of my really really close friends who was also I also identified as um, a masculine masculine of center lesbian woman, um, and I asked her how does she feel comfortable in her body? Does she love her body? And she says, absolutely. I love everything about my body. I love my masculinity and my femininity, how they work together and things like that. And for me, I that's how I knew that there was something different. And I didn't, until I didn't learn what trans was or that, tra that I can transition, that there was, there was, I can medically transition and maybe have my body fit more so how I felt um, until I was 19 and I was watch I was on YouTube and I saw a, a trans guy documenting his transition and I was just like oh my god um, but to backtrack about uh, support I had I, my, my friends in, in school were always super supportive um, when I was I had gone through some personal things with my parents and um, I felt like I was on my own for a while and uh, a couple of, of the girls on the basketball team and also some of my like other classmates, they made sure that they like really pushed me to go, go into the college office, make sure that I was getting my college applications in, made sure that my, that, that my grades were, were, that I was staying on top of my grades and, and also just there to listen to me when I, I needed, needed a friend. So I was very fortunate that I had those folks as well as um, the staff members that were there to, to also push me, the people at the college office, um, my coaches, they were, they were always there to uh, uplift me. Although I, we didn't really talk about queerness much, but they were just, they just wanted to make sure that I, school academics was, was so important. So they just wanted to make sure that that was okay. And they did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's like, it's such a struggle to, for everybody to find their identity, especially at a young age. And that shouldn't affect your academics and stuff like that, but it does. So it's good that you had like a strong support system with your chosen family, which Camp Lightbulb likes to think of themselves as a chosen family, which we totally are. Um, what advice would you give to queer youth that don't have adequate, adequate support? Um, I mean, I think that there's, we have, we have now a lot of resources that we didn't, that I didn't have growing up. Um, I know that it is important to have, um, support that's, that you can actually go see in person and that you can connect with. Um, but if you do not have that, I think that there, you can always look for, um, resources like Camp Light Bulb, um, where you can meet virtually, where you can chat online about about what it is that you're feeling and and connect with people that are like you. I think one thing that um, I learned and I continue to kind of go back to as I as I get older is is that whatever it is that you're going through at any given moment, you are not alone. There are many people that are experiencing something very similar, if not sometimes exactly the same thing. And and um, that's to me at least it, it could be comforting uh, knowing that you can connect with someone and maybe even help each other get through whatever it is that you're you're going through um and even and i think that we all we also have the capacity to to empathize i think because uh as a queer community we've been through we we for the most part i can't say that everyone's been through something super traumatic that that's or maybe they can. I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like I haven't, I haven't spoken to enough young folks because uh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'm in my, my early thirties now. So I, I know that when I was even in my, my late twenties, mid twenties, um, there was all this talk about from older, older queer people about how you, you guys have it so easy. Um, and I always say, it may not. It may seem easier to you because you faced something different, but it, you can't take it. You can't take away from another individual's experience, even though it might be. It might seem easier. I think we're still going through the same, very similar struggles um, as folks were going through 10, 20 years ago. Where yes, we have more representation, we have more visibility, we have more freedoms. Um, but as we see, you know, with what's going on in government, what's going on in Florida, what's going on in Texas, there's still this this pushback. And there's constant pushback and we have to 
continue um, fighting for our our right to just be to exist, to be visible, to take up space in in society. Yeah, the the fight will be endless, but we will prevail as history has. Yes. <laughs> has proved, proven to us. Um, how has your identity contributed to your success in life, not just as a model? Um, I think that because there, there weren't many um, images of trans masculine people in media, that did, I think that that definitely helped um, with my success in, in entertainment um, because of the, the conversation moving forward and I attribute that to uh, like folks that came way before me I I see that more and more doors are opening um for trans men and trans women and non-binary folks and every everyone in between all all our our, our siblings under under our rainbow umbrella and um yeah I mean there, there's been it's attributed to success but it because it's still relatively new. It's also attributed to opportunities being taken away um, because there's the, this feeling that, oh, society isn't ready, um, especially um, with television. Um, because if we, if we just focus on like big cities, New York, uh, Los Angeles, um, uh, even Chicago, all, those, all the big cities that are, tend to be hub, hubs for, for queer folks, they're gonna be, they're, they tend to be a little more, more liberal and okay with with queer content in, in media. But if you go to the Bible Belt, um, places that are a little bit more conservative or a lot more conservative, they they definitely push back um, off to networks where they're like, we don't want to see this queer stuff on, and we don't want to expose our kids. And we see that, again, that's kind of the, the argument that they're making. They're demonizing queer people um, and saying that they're going, they're trying to essentially turn everyone else gay, which is ridiculous but um so in that sense there's been there's been some pushback but again i like you said we always prevail and as time goes on we get more and we're we're not i'm not i'm not gonna stop fighting for for what i believe is is right and also for for example in, in film and television the roles that i feel i can i can play can you tell us about some of the activism you've done and the type of progress you would like to see happen? Um, I mean, I, I started off, before I started doing anything in entertainment, I worked at Callan Lord Community Health Center in New York. Um, so a lot of my work was uh, initially um, around trans sensitivity training. So I, I did trans sensitivity trainings at homeless shelters. Um, and I also worked with with homeless youth in, in general and, and also helped folks that were um, trying to get out of addiction, um, find resources to help them with that. Um, and you, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. What was the, the question I want to go back to? <laughs> um, the, the activism work that you've done and the progress you want to see. Yes. So I, I'm also, I work with an organization called Flux. Um, and they've, when I moved to, when I moved to Los Angeles, um, after I did the, uh, that reality show strut, I had, I, I mean, I, 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 it was just, it was a dream. I thought that um, I, I left my job um, working at the, at that LGBT center in New York. And I, um, I said, I'm going to dive into this. I want to be visible. I also, I've, I've always been so afraid to go into the arts and I felt like I had to follow this, this straight and narrow path into success, which meant do really great in school and then get a, get a, a, a great paying job and, and, that's it. And I, I never, I, I thought that there was always like a ceiling to that. And not that that's not okay, because recently I've been thinking about going back to school for medicine and I was just like, okay, I'm doing too much right now. But um, uh, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit hundred percent. And I moved to Los Angeles. Um, and the first year and a half to two years was a struggle. I was completely broke. <laughs> I, um, I had like nothing. I had gone through my entire savings um, from work and I was just like ready to move back to my parents' house and kind of start over. And um, Flux came along. Um, the founder, her name is, is Victoria Ortega. And she was just like, hey, we're doing 
um, our launch. This is what our organization is about. They're essentially about elevating the, the um, visibility and platforms of trans and non-binary people um, and push us into spaces that we were normally not allowed in um, for one reason, reason or another. And it was beautiful. We went into these, these amazing, gorgeous spaces um, where, you know, the cis straight folks are just like, what are these queer people doing here? And they were like, yes, we're here. <laughs> I was going to say the B word. I'm like, I don't know if I can <laughs> Like, yes, we're here. Um, and just, it was amazing, but everyone came together and we, um, like trans folks got to engage with other people um, outside of the community, tell their stories and the organization began to grow. Um, so we, we've utilized kind of, they utilize a lot of influencers for, for these, these events because influencers can, can kind of garner their following and also bring more people and um, get more attention. And they've uh, opened chapters um, all over California. They have a couple chapters in, in Florida. They have some chapters even overseas. And um, they're, they're going to continue to grow. I'm really happy to be part of that. And I'm happy to see um, all trans people really working in, in this organization as the leaders and pushing this forward. Yeah, I feel like, um... Well, it sounds like that organization saved you in many ways, oh, both yeah. from your, yeah. your financial struggles. Oh, yeah, financial struggles. Yeah, all of it. I was just like, oh. Trust me, I know what it's like yeah. in LA. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to open up this Q&A to our campers. Campers, use your reaction hand raise to, if you have a question for Lace. I think I see, I'm, I opened the chat on the side here on my screen. I see oh, some perfect. questions there as well. Cool. Let's see. You can go ahead and pick one from that chat and answer. I mean, someone asked, I think, okay, Gabe, um, what is what is it like to be a model and what do you suggest people do when some when some I guess there's is that a typo do when some Meet some when we meet someone that doesn't support someone's gender identity. Um, so being a model is quite interesting. So as a as a trans man that is not not generally perceived as trans um, unless people know who, who know who I am, which mo most of the time they do. But there are times where um, my agent will send me out to a job, and um, I'm not necessarily visibly trans unless again you know you know me and. Uh, the, there, there's a, there tends to be a lot of conversation around it. So if they don't know, um, then the, the job continues. And it's up to me if I feel that it's, if I'm safe enough to disclose or not. Generally, it, I do feel safe, um, but it's not, I don't always feel that is a topic of conversation um, if it's a really, really quick job and I'm only working with this individual one time and I, don't, and, and I just don't want folks sexualizing me a lot. So like the, that ends up being... I don't want to call it an issue, but it's an issue. <laughs> it's because uh, I'm also on the ACE spectrum. So I understand that because of how I kind of became known, it was because of my body and how I was being photographed and like really almost nothing. Um, so I understand that when folks are looking, they're just, there may be, that's going to happen. Um, but it does, it can get uncomfortable when, when people cross the line. So I had to quickly learn to set boundaries, um, which I've always had trouble with. I always, I'm like, this is a transmasculine urge to please everyone. <laughs> and like, you know, just, it's okay, but it's not okay. So I've been learning to set those boundaries and say like, hey, I'm not, I'm not, this not, it's not cool. You can't just don't, don't touch me. Also, <laughs> uh, don't say that's not appropriate to say. And like, Unfortunately, it, it lends to like just having to educate all the time, which I think um, it's great. Like I don't, I don't view it as this this huge burden. It's definitely, I feel like it's my duty almost to to educate, especially in spaces that again we we weren't allowed in, and um, it can be it can take its toll at times. So there there are moments where if I feel like I need to conserve my energy and I feel that it's not worth it, then I'll just. I'll kind of just pull back, but for the most part, I would say, hey, um, I'll educate on whatever it is that's going on, and, and if they, there are any questions and it's coming from a genuine place, I'll, I'll always answer. Um, yeah, I feel like nowadays, I mean, the information is out there. Anybody yeah. can simply Google and learn, 
and it shouldn't be your burden to educate people, but I feel like you might also feel um, pressure to be, you know, to say who you are just for representation's sake. You oh, know? There's, there's always, there's that as well. So there's been moments where I'm like on, on a plane going to like a pride event, for example, and I'll be going like the last, last one that I went to was in in North Carolina. So I went to one in North Carolina and another in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, very conservative places. And I remember I was sitting uh, on the plane and in bo both instances, it older, like very conservative, conservative gentlemen sat next to me and they kind of looked at me like, where is this person uh, going? Maybe wondering, I don't know if, I, if it was the way that I was dressed or what I looked like, whatever the case might be, they looked over and were like, so what brings you to Tulsa, Oklahoma? Or what bring, brings you to, to, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm actually going to a Pride event. And I, I disclosed my, that I was trans and they were, you know, both instances taken aback a little bit. And um, one, I don't, I can't recall at the, at the moment, that just stopped talking to me completely. And the other one was very intrigued and we spoke for a bit and I just felt um, I mean, it's not going to happen all the time, but like now this person who may have never met a trans person before can go back to whoever and say, hey, I met this trans guy on the plane today. He was nice or whatever he thought of me, but there's there's some form of connection. And I think that for especially for policymaking and 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 all these you know bills that are being passed, if if there's some sort of connection to someone that that is affected um, personally by uh, anti-trans bill, for example, now maybe they can have a second thought like, hey, I have to really think about this human being that I met. And there, it's not just about me. And I think, like you said, when it comes to, yes, there's information online and you can Google trans 101 and try to learn um, whatever it is. But I, I just don't think that folks are, folk, people, at least in my opinion, they tend to not look up things that don't affect them directly. Mm -hmm. So if they if they haven't been affected directly or if they don't know someone personally, the chances of them looking it up is slim to none unless they're super like curious. Yeah, you have to human we have to humanize ourselves, unfortunately. Yeah. But these one-on-one -on -one conversations are what make the biggest impact because these people are voting. So the yeah, those moments yeah. are very important. Yeah. Um, do we have more questions for Lays? Someone, I think James, is it Jamie, uh, commented about saying that they don't want, they don't want to, they don't want children hearing about, um, about it because they think that it's a sexual thing, even though it's not. And I totally agree. I think that, I mean, cis straight folks are sexualizing kids all the time. Like, hey, ladies, man, or like, oh, you're going to, you're going to hurt them or whatever. And, and, and you see like all sorts of things. Um, I, I think that the issue is just, they don't want, they think that they're, they're the ones that are sexualizing children at the end of the day. And it's not, it's not our community. Agreed. Agreed. Because we know more than anybody that it's, we're more than that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any questions for Lace? Please raise your hand. Don't be shy now. I'm like all in the screen looking. <laughs> I know there's so many. Okay, we got, let's see, from Buddy. Have you ever felt held back in your career due to your gender identity or sexuality? Uh, yes. So, I mean, I'm sure folks have heard, whole, heard st stories about um, the entertainment industry. I think sometimes in modeling and even in acting you know as you i'm sure some of you have heard of the the me too movement there is that expectation at times and um and this is me being very candid there there's been moments where maybe there was an expectation of you have to do something to get something in return and i'm like mm, i rather not get anything at all and and leave um, I've always stood by that and I don't judge anyone that felt feels or has felt the need to go forth and, and do what, you know, I don't judge anyone, like do what you have to do. But for me, I just couldn't, could not do that. So I think that I've missed out. I would, I, I mean, if I, if I didn't get an opportunity because I didn't do something that I didn't want to do, um, then that wasn't for me. 
but other someone uh, on on the other side can say like, oh, you missed out on an opportunity because you wouldn't do X, Y, and Z. And I'm just like, well, then that wasn't, it just wasn't for me. Um, there's that sense. And what was the, the first part of that question? I, I, um, have you felt held back in your back. career? Um, and like I, I think I mentioned earlier, there were moments where um, maybe the folks that I, were, that I was working with directly, they were like, oh, this is great. We need this for visibility. And they really wanted to push uh, certain things forward. But whoever was in charge, whoever was their boss was like, okay, no, this is, it's too soon. We're not ready. Um, or we don't know what to do with you. I've gotten that several times from, from people. Um, we think you're great. We know who you are, but we don't know what to do with you. And I was just like, what do you mean you don't know what to do with me? You do with me what you do with anyone else that's um you know a, a male model like you you got this guy who has a similar look to me uh this campaigner you put him put him forward for this job why can't you do the same thing with me we're like i don't understand but there's there's that language that's been used a lot that we don't know what to do with you yeah, well, yeah. what a shame yeah they, they miss out on the opportunity right <laughs> um atlas says do you think that being trans gives you a different outlook in the men's modeling industry than a cisgender queer man in the same industry if so can you explain like how it's different for you um i mean i can't speak on on other people's experience um i think that because I'm, I, again, I'm a trans, I'm a trans man. I, and I'm also not necessarily visibly trans. Um, I kind of, there's, there are moments where I do blend in. So the, the, the fact that I am trans may have gotten me, may have gotten me through the door. Um, but there have been moments where even the, like the photographer or, or whoever, the, the person that's uh, styling, makeup artist, makeup artist just has, doesn't know. Um, but as we're talking and when they're doing makeup, then I'll, I'll just, I'll disclose. And um, I'm just, I've kind of blend in. So there's, there's not much happening there, but there's, there, I, that's where I feel, I usually feel the need to disclose just for visibility's sake. Like the, I am, I am a trans person. I am in this room. Um, hear me. <laughs> <laughs> as far as cisgender, another cisgender queer person, um, hmm. I think, especially in modeling, almost, they're all queer. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, not all, but for the most, a lot of people in, in the modeling industry, whether they're models themselves or the folks working in the back and like behind, behind the camera, a lot of cis queer folks. We're, I, I'd say even trans, like we're, we're now everywhere. Um, the thing, the reason, I think the reason that we're not, I mean, visibility has changed a lot, but I think they're, they're, we're not at the forefront is because there is this, this, that idea that we're pushing it into people's faces, but I'm just like, we just exist. We're part of society. We're, we're here every day. So if you really want, uh, media and fashion and television and everything that is truly representative of what it is that we see on a daily basis, then we have to be included because we are here. Exactly. Like anybody in opposition, they're the ones that are making us have to disclose who we are. Mm -hmm. Like we have the pride flag and we have our shirts that say gay and, yeah. and, <laughs> and everything because they don't want us to exist or acknowledge our existence. So we have to do that because of them. So yeah. they shouldn't be complaining. It's their fault. Yeah. <laughs> Vicky says, have you ever felt the need to be overly masculine to prove to others or yourself that you're a man? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it's really interesting. So before I transitioned, you know, people would be like, oh my God, you're, you're so masculine, like for a woman. And now it's just like, you must be, when people don't know that I'm trans, I'm like, you must be gay because you're so sweet, like <laughs> sweet or like sweet meaning if like effeminate or flamboyant or whatever. And I'm just like, really? Okay. So I've, I've actually, I've, I always, I use this language, like my transition has, tra I've transitioned within my transition. Um, meaning where there were, there were moments where I felt that not only for other people, but for myself, I, in order to be affirmed, I had to put on almost this mask of masculinity. And it's not that it wasn't true to who I, I, I am or was, but there was definitely a performative factor. Um, and as I've become more free, I, I'm kind of like pushing away those, those, 
these these boxes and these these roles that we have to play um without not we we have to play that are placed upon us or placed upon cert, like certain gender um or the two genders that most people only like to to, <laughs> to admit exist um but uh so yeah I, I i say this now it's like my my masculinity is feminine and my femininity my femininity is masculine so there is there the only time that i can i can say honestly that i play my masculinity up a little bit is if i feel unsafe so mm -hmm. if i'm in a situation where i know that being perceived as queer in any regard might be dangerous then i might lower my voice and <laughs> stop inflecting as much but for the most part how i'm expressing myself now is just how i am yeah and we don't always feel masculine 100 of the time or feminine 100 percent of the time some like one second i'm like hey girl and the next yeah exactly like, oh. <laughs> i mean it's it's very interesting to hear um how i am perceived by other folks because i've, I've been told like oh you're super masked but then when I'm, i've been around like cis straight men and they're just like oh i thought you were gay and i asked them i'm like why why do you think that and they were like well you you're very expressive and and um i don't i guess i mean being in for example like barbershop talk i'm actually having an appointment to the barbershop after we finish this and he's the one that told me this he said that generally when the men come into the barbershop to get their to get their haircuts there's not much talking and if there is it's just like hey i was the game and you see that hot babe over there and then it's just like silence and you're just whatever and i'm just like hey how are you how's your girl and i'm just talking about all these things how's your family and the, to that to him that was feminine and i was i was just like oh, interesting how we just really how we're taught to gender all these things that shouldn't be it should just be a characteristic of mine that I'm maybe caring or that I'm asking you about how your day was or how your family is doing and not just staying silent and and asking about a game <laughs> I don't I don't know <laughs> yeah we definitely have to break down that toxic masculinity barrier that's keeping yeah. us from being our whole selves yeah and um, I, I think that some people are that could be who who you are but I think taking like you said, that toxicity out of it is important because I think, I do think that there's, we've been moving, there's this movement or that a lot of cis straight men feel that their masculinity is being attacked. And um, I think that that needs to be reframed because it's not an attack on your masculinity and your, or your manhood. It's more so of a calling out and bringing in of the, of certain characteristics that you thought that you were taught were masculine and meant you were being a man, but are actually hurtful to yourself and others. Agreed. Um, Gabe says, what do you suggest to do or say when somebody meets another person who doesn't support that person for their gender identity or sexuality? Hmm. Let's see. I want to read it as myself, too, so I can get an idea of... Uh... Well, if you meet someone, if they're, if they're not anyone that's close to you... Um... You're, we're going to encounter people that don't like us. We're going to encounter people that don't agree with one aspect of who we are, whatever, whether it's our queerness or something else. Um, There's something that it is that that's it's tough. It was hard for me because, again, I'm, I was such a people pleaser and I wanted everyone to like me. Um, but the fact is that not everyone is going to like not everyone's going to like you and not everyone is going to want to know who you are. Um, and that might hurt at first. Um, but a lot of times if this, this is what kind of helped me is also realizing that if, if someone doesn't like me and they don't really know me, or maybe they're judging me based on one encounter where I, you know, people, we are, we are, we can be so different depending on, on things that happen to us right before we meet someone else. So if I, there's been, there's actually been, uh, scientific, there's been studies that show if, if someone handed me a hot cup of coffee five minutes before I met you, I might be warmer towards you than I would if someone handed me cold brew. And I, I thought that was fascinating that there's so many things that can factor into how you're perceived. But if someone doesn't like you in other, this is, that was completely off topic, but if someone doesn't like you, it's sometimes it's 
it's about how they feel about themselves or they can be projecting whatever it is that they've that they associate you with in their lives so it's a lot of times when when as we're moving through the world it's not about us it's about them and vice versa we're moving through the world and the way that we perceive the world is is based usually on our own experiences with each of these things yeah and our gender and our sexuality is only just small parts of our identity so if this person doesn't agree with your your gender or sexuality then you might just have to just be yourself and show them that you're more than that mm -hmm. and once they get to know you then then they're gonna accept you for who you are and if not then you don't need them in your life right yeah <laughs> um last call for questions because we don't want to keep late from his haircut <laughs> <laughs> that's not into that's i have i have i have time. Oh, later oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> perfect all right. Any more questions for Lathe? And the, uh, I didn't even want to. I'm, I just recently, this is off topic. I I, re I shaved my like my hair maybe three months ago. I'm growing it back out. And I have uh, a shoot for headshots on Monday. And I want to look a little pretty. So. Well, yeah, I'm wearing a hat because I need a haircut. <laughs> just, so give me the name of your barber and I'll, I'll meet you over there. <laughs> Winslow. <laughs> he's really, he's really in Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. I'm in Los Angeles as well. He's right. He's in Hollywood. Oh, cool. That's not far. Uh, all right. More questions for Lace? Like, ask me anything. <laughs> I'll try to add my best to answer. I feel like this is it's so great to be here because it's so funny. I feel I, I I keep like mumbling over my words and and or stuttering over my words because I have I feel like I haven't engaged with people in so long like since be pre since before the pandemic and I I feel like my social skills and my ability to communicate certain things have it's like wow I'm really out of kind of practice. <laughs> totally, I get that. Um, Alice says, "Who's your favorite superhero and why is it Spider Man?" That was, <laughs> you know what's funny I always like I liked Superman um for a very long time because because I I admired uh like that Boy Scout especially with within my transition I always wanted to be like the, the good good guy the you know Boy Scout that did the right thing all the time and um also when I was in high school I was obsessed with Smallville on the CW and and Tom Welling that played you know Clark I was obsessed with that show and I want I wanted to be Clark Kent <laughs> me too that's, yeah. why, that's the only reason why I wear with, the, with the glasses right <laughs> <laughs> I used to wear my Superman costume to bed when I was like three years old but I do like Spider-Man <laughs> as well I actually I would pull out my Spider-Man game but it's over there <laughs> I play Spider-Man on Spider-Man games are the most fun to play <laughs> yeah. Um, Nate says, does your identity, oh, where is it? Does your identity make it difficult for modeling? Like do certain types of models or poses make you uncomfortable? No, it actually makes me more comfortable. So a lot of uh, what I've, I've found, at least from photographer's perspective, what they have told me is that when, there are moments where they get uh, cis straight models and they want them to pose a certain way or maybe um, wear certain clothes and they're for the most part, they, they're comfortable, but there, there are times that are just like, oh, I'm not, I'm not comfortable wearing that, or I'm not comfortable posing in that way. I think that because I'm, I'm queer, and I'm, I'm more, I, my, like, femininity and masculinity, they're, they're not so rigid for me. I'm able to play within, that, like, the spectrum, so I'm, I'm totally comfortable with, usually with, with any outfit or any pose, for the most part. <laughs> 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 all right um mint or travis says after realizing you were trans did you still feel attracted to women in the same way or did it change um i'm a, i'm asexual so i'm not aromantic asexual but I, I mean i do have i did date women before my transition um my i do still have attraction to femininity um but it did it did definitely it did change so i didn't really look at at men at all <laughs> um i mean there was admiration for masculinity and and like the the i guess male form if you will um but post transition um i, I don't know i was just like 
this twinkie little boy is with the with the heels on is really cute <laughs> but just but it, it's still it's always never super like sexual in nature again because i'm not really sexual it's like oh i, I just appreciate beauty in all its forms so it's kind of just evolved into that nice any more questions for lace Thank you so much for being so open and like yeah, no, no problem. So much. I feel like we're we're learning a lot about you. Not a problem. I'm happy to be here and, and have a conversation. All right. Alice says, I feel that after I realized I was trans, I started to realize I didn't feel attracted to women. It was more of a feeling of envy. I I uh I remember I mean I did feel there was some envy towards my brother growing up especially after he started going through puberty and I, I'm, I'm the old, I'm the oldest. So my, my younger brother is, um, is three years younger than me. And I remember the moment he started to go through his puberty and I was just like, he was getting all the features and the things happening that I wish that I would get. And there was some envy at, at first. And, um, yeah, I just, I felt, I felt so ugly and unattractive to be honest. And I thought I was like, wow, he's getting, bigger and more handsome and I'm just like gross over here that's that's how I internalized it <laughs> um so that's I think that that feeling is normal there, there was also in the very beginning of my transition imposter syndrome for me like I felt that I was that I was putting on this mask and everything that everyone was telling me about being trans was true that I I was that I would never like I was kind of internalizing everything that other people would tell me about my manhood or masculinity and my transness like oh you're you're still a woman um you are always going to be a woman you're just you can take all the hormones you want like that's not going to change who you are like what you, you really are there were all these terrible things and and it was so it was very tough for me the first um two years after I started um like hormone therapy um there were and I wanted to like just rush into everything i wanted all the changes to happen super fast i wanted to get top surgery and even lower surgery immediately immediately there was there was there was this this sense that i needed to to hurry it up and then there were moments where i was just like what am i doing i'll never be who i want to be like, like it was it was very some negative uh self-talk as well and it took some time and I, getting with my chosen family and meeting other trans people and hearing their experiences where I learned like, no, this is, this is who I am and where I am in my transition and what my body is right now. It's perfect. It's perfectly fine. And I'm, and I became just, just so, so much happier. Yeah. Look at you yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Toby wants to know what advice do you have for LGBTQ youth who are scared to express themselves due to living in a conservative place? Yeah. Um, that's a tough one because I, I grew up in New York and it's a little more liberal and it's kind of, there's so many queer people kind of everywhere and they're out. Um, I, I always stress safety first, especially within your home, because I worked with homeless youth and a lot of the homeless youth were put out, um, because their, their parents or their guardians weren't supportive. Um, and getting out of that system is just so hard. So I always stress like if you can wait until you're safe enough to come out, do so. Um, I know it's, it sucks, but being on the streets and having to be out there and surviving, it, it's not an easy situation. Yeah. And I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I mean, yeah. it's, it's tough either way. Um, but for, I guess for me, I, I'd rather you have a roof over your head food in your in your belly and you're able to go to school and continue getting your education if that is if that's what you want to do so that you can get yourself out of out of that situation later yeah and know that you do have a whole community in the lgbtq yeah. community <laughs> to to go to yeah. i mean i'm sure like even in conservative places like i mean we exist everywhere so there's yeah. got to be some kind of like uh, P flags and stuff, uh, those organizations that you might have to search a little hard for, but they're out there. They're out there for sure. Yeah. I think um, one thing that that um, queer folks have done in 
historically and even now it's just when you especially if you grew up in a conservative space is you leave the conservative place to a more liberal place and um it is important to kind of to go back i think because the queer kids that are growing up at that moment need someone to look up to they need those organizations they need that support and if everyone just leaves, it's kind of starting over, over and over again in those conservative places, which is, which is why I think those conservative places remain conservative because the queer people leave. And yes, it, it's dangerous, but I think if, if we turn out in numbers and we create these organizations and we kind of uh, infiltrate these spaces, I think that there's, there, there could be a lot of room for change. Yeah, like that show, like, I mean, Queer Eye and yeah. we hear these TV shows where they literally go into these conservative spaces and, you know, show that, you know, we're here, we're queer, we're, yeah. we're fabulous. <laughs> right. We're going to gay this place up, like, yeah. basically. <laughs> um, Cleo says, as an A-spec person, how do you confront the I can fix you mentality, like, over sexualization of asexual asexuality. I don't know if this is a universal thing, but peers have always given me hell for my aceness. Yeah, I mean it's tough because no one understands and no one listens to me when I say that I'm ace. They're just like I'm. I'm like I'm ace, and they're just like, so what do you like? I I just told you. I, I, okay, I'm not. <laughs> there's or there's this 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 uh, idea that. Um, oh, someone hurt you, and that's why you're ace. So, so I can fix you, and you'll be able to have these feelings again. And I'm just, you're not listening to me. It's really, it's really, it can be frustrating to to talk about. Um, and then especially in in this industry that that there is a hypersexualization of kind of people in general. Um, so, for example, as an actor, I'm sent out usually because of my appearance. Um, and my body, I'm sent out for sometimes for roles that are sexual in nature. And um, I can totally, I can play it. And there's certain, I mean, there's certain boundaries that I, I have told like my, my agent and my team, like, hey, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, so if that particular part in the scene needs to be performed, they either need to get a double or, or I'm just out, like, no, um, we have to figure that out. And if they're like, usually if, if they're okay with it, cool, we can proceed. If not, then I'll pass on the job. Um, but there have been moments where they're just like, how okay are you, or not okay are you with this and that? And it's just, it's really frustrating. Cause I'm like, why does everything have to be sexual y'all? Like, I understand that human beings are sexual beings, sure, but not everyone's sexual. <laughs> And I think those stories need to be told as well. Um, and actually speaking about that, I'm, I'm going to Virginia uh, early next month uh, to shoot a movie about asexuality. And the person that, that reached out to me for it, I, I don't play the asexual character, which was a bummer. Um, but uh, when I read the script, I identified, I was like, that is me, the, the ace character. I'm like, that's me, because he was, the character is, is so, he was trying to date while in high school um, and even after high school kind of figuring things out and when he finally learns that he's ace and he learns that about that language um he felt so much freer but the the individual or like the woman that he that he was in a relationship with, with prior to just was so in love with him didn't kind of didn't want to let him go and there's that tug and pull between that relationship because he still does care about her there's still feelings there but he's just not he's not sexual <laughs> so there's there's some uh some issues within the relationship there do you feel drained having to explain these different aspects of yourself and if you do like how do you practice self-care i mean absolutely i mean i'm human i get tired i always say like i'm in a i'm constantly tired <laughs> and i'm like i don't want to be constantly tired but i don't i don't go out much to be honest i kind of i stay to myself for the most part um and I like to be at home. So I, I am a, a homebody. And when I'm going, when, if I have to, if I'm going out, it's usually if a, like a best, really close friends, like birthday, or um, it's a networking event, or I'm supporting a friend um, somewhere. Like I recently went to uh, HR, an HRC dinner um, because my friend, uh, Brian Michael, who's an actor and he's on 911 Lone Star, great, he's, mentor to me he's a fantastic guy um i think he's he was one of the first trans men on television that, that i really truly admired 
um, his work, his work ethic and his ability to really transform himself into whatever character he's playing. But um, I went to support him. Um, he was being honored at, at um, this event and I wanted to show up for him. So I usually show up for those things. But for the most part, I'm just like, hey, you can come over. <laughs> Well, send them our way because we'd yeah. love to have Brian here with us. Oh, Brian? Sure. Yeah, I'll, yeah I'll reach out to him and, or I'll give you his, his contact information. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Jimmy wants to know what's the name of the movie? That Brian's in? It's a, it's a TV show. It's called 911 Lone Star. On the, the Ace movie that year. Oh, the Ace movie. <laughs> um, I, I can't say. Okay. Yeah. So we'll be following. Wait, wait, I'll definitely career, let so. you know as soon as I can because I, I I want I definitely want to share. But it's uh we start filming it uh April, I think April 7th. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This will be our last call for questions. So if you have a question, drop it in our chat. I mean, I, I'm, I can always also come back and we can chat some more. We would love to have you back um, every Saturday. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> you can it even participate. <laughs> you can even participate in our variety show, which we're going to do right after this. Okay. So, yeah, come back and think of like a talent to show us and you can jump. In. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> Or I can be an audience. I can watch everyone else perform. I, I doesn't you can have do whatever you want. <laughs> um. All right. Well, that is the end of our Q&A with Laith Ashley. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And have a good weekend. And I'll look at your Instagram to see how your haircut. Uh, my haircut. Does. <laughs> I probably won't look much different from what it looks like right now. I'm just cleaning up the sides a little bit. All right. <laughs> but have thank a good you. weekend. Bye.